I want to think about how music has provided a particular kind of technology for me to rebuild. From that moment of existential crisis where I felt that, um, if we could just say, I shattered, my sense of reality was shattered, I used music from that moment until today as a technology to reconsolidate, I guess, to build whatever it is that I am. Foucault kind of called this the aesthetics of self, and there's a lot of people that talk about the aesthetics of self since Foucault was writing about it. I think what he and, and others, when they talk about the aesthetics of self, I think what they mean is creativity. They just want to impress upon us that self is a creative enterprise. And I think aesthetics in the sense of uh, you go to the beauty salon and you see an aesthetician, you become an aesthetician of yourself. You put yourself in the chair and you make yourself beautiful. Or at least you make yourself in a way that you think is beautiful. And I think that's valuable, but I think it's all, I think it opens, it opens a conversation that we haven't, I don't think we've had yet. And this is the conversation that I want to introduce. The idea of aesthetics of self, thinking about, of course, the term aesthetics. A wonderful and easy to understand term, of course. It's terrible. It's a terrible word. It's terrible, because it means a gazillion different things. It means aesthetic, meaning it's beautiful, like in the sense of uh, the, um, wow, let's have an aesthetic experience. Or aesthetic meaning a particular formation or a particular style. Or aesthetic meaning that it has to do with, with, uh, with art pieces or has to do with art. Andre and I spent an entire semester talking about aesthetics and dance. And the entire, every, every, every week we came back to the seminar having the same conversation over and over again. And we attended, I think, to have a conversation about the aesthetics of dance, and it became a kind of endless search for what it is, this, the edges of this framework of this thing that we call aesthetics. And I think coming to terms with the, the notion of aesthetics or the multiple ways we can understand aesthetics is increasingly important. If you look down at the, uh, the bottom of the number of mentions, I love being a quantification of words, it's brilliant. From 1800 to 2010, uh, aesthetics shows up in, in increasing, uh, increasing frequency. I don't think that's an accident. The information revolution that set off at the end of the 19th century with a, a, a number of techniques and an increasingly growing number of techniques and technologies provides us a way of using aesthetic information as a mean of communication. It's no longer, uh, it's no longer just a, a, a something that an artist does, it's something that we all do. And like I've said a countless times, the, number, the amount of time that we spend on Facebook picking the right, the right profile picture, the, number of, the amount of time that we spend posing, presenting, constructing, the amount of conversations that we have about branding ourselves, making ourselves, shaping ourselves, presenting ourselves, showing ourselves, the number of shows that are about rebuilding your homes, rebuilding yourself, rebuilding your relationship, the number of magazines dedicated to rebuilding your sex life, rebuilding, we know that we are constantly engaged in an aesthetic construction of self. And some people are winning, while many of us aren't discussing what the implications, the geopolitical implications of a growing industry of the aesthetics of self. What is this thing that we're engaged in? We know, this is from two days ago, we know that certain players in the global economy know exactly what this is. That, that we bit the apple of, uh, of technology. That, that once again, the apple, of, you know, the apple has been you know, chomped on and now we're, we're in for an adventure. What's that adventure? How do we frame it? In this entire presentation, it's gonna be about one word. But I, when, you leave this, when you leave the presentation, I want you to leave with one word, mediation. When Marx was talking about mediation, he imagined a cobbler sitting at a bench making a pair of shoes, hammering, shaping, 
and ultimately selling a pair of shoes. What Marx imagined with all of the industries and exchanges and processes necessary to make the leather, to frame the sole, to produce the laces, to make the nails, to, to make the hammer, to make the shop that the shopkeeper was working in, that would come to a point of focus when the shopkeeper sold the pair of shoes. Marx argued that labor was the focusing of a global network of production. That moment of singularity Marx called mediation. And that moment in that, I think, is the beginning of a complex view of the social sciences. I believe we need to do the same now with ourselves as the moment of mediation. That we are the cobbler and our life is our labor and that we are producing ourselves with using aesthetic resources provided and shaped for us. And in this sense, our subjectivity and the global information economy have to be understood in a continuum and in a, in a constantly morphing relationship that some people like Apple completely understand, at least they position themselves economically based on this relationship. Apple went from being something that you bought in a basement store with somebody wearing corduroy jeans and long hair uh, in 2000 to 2005 to now being a, a major, a major global design concept that's changing how we understand ourselves, our relationship to each other, and the kind of aesthetic framework that we're, that we're negotiating. Marx's notion of mediation is not unproblematic, but it, it helps to give us some direction. One of the things that Foucault added is the notion of governmentality. I think we need to understand this in terms of aesthetic governmentality. The production, the moment of mediation, and critical mediation where power takes place. And, maybe contrary to that, nomadic aesthetics. The idea that, sure, there's these aesthetic moments and aesthetic powers and aesthetic influence, but that doesn't stop us from being creative, subversive. Let's return to my moment of experiencing Rage Against the Machine. That was my moment of unleashing an, uh, a nomadic aesthetics of self that I began to explore. I began to look at the world and see the world as a force, and I began to jam it. I began to get, I got involved in a, mo a movement called culture jamming, and it was really simple. It boiled down to moments like this, when you take a red sticker and you cover over four-way with two words, and all of a sudden, a stop sign becomes a political moment or you take a red sticker that says watching television and you put it directly under the stop sign in that little space. So on Monday morning, somebody rolls up to the stop sign, blurry eyed with a cup of coffee, cup of coffee and looks up and says, and sees, stop watching television. And Saturday <laughs> night, me and my friends were giggling, <laughs> gleefully running around Halifax putting these, stop, putting these stickers underneath the word stop at every intersection that we could find. We were engaged in making knowledge. We were engaged in jamming the aesthetic environment that we were living in. And in doing that, it created an opportunity. It empowered us. We felt that we were engaged in the aesthetic system and that we all just weren't rolling around uh, forced into a, a, a network of forces that were beyond our control. <laughs>
the notion of nomadic aesthetic resources, the idea that we could use our creativity critically, that we could use it for the, in the act of self-production, and in the act of self-producing, that we create uh, collections of people that we call community. What we recognized, making punk music is probably the same thing that people recognized in the 80s and in the 70s and in the 60s and in the 30s and in the late 1800s when a whole bunch of artists were getting together in parts of Paris going underground and making something that, uh, that was outside of the official structures of power. What was unleashed is aesthetic multiplicities, new aesthetic universes where artists recognized as being members of the underground by themselves, not giving a shit what anybody else thought, unleashed processes that they were growing into. Foucault said, the technologies of self, or the technologies of culture, can be understood in these kind of four large ideas, through production, signification, value, Foucault said domination. That's too simple. I like to think of it in terms of value. Value is a form of, of domination that we have to theorize and think about. And productions of self. Together, we return to a complex idea of mediation. Now with heavy on the media part of mediation. What is this thing that we call mediation if we theorize it beyond, beyond what, uh, what Marx did? Lawrence Grossberg in Cultural Studies in the Future Tense said, mediation is reality, not just culture. And this is, this is coming from somebody that's interested in teasing out a cultural studies in the contemporary, uh, in a contemporary mediated environment. Mediation is reality, not just culture. And this is the part that gets scary. The, the notion of the white rabbit, I think, is incredibly valuable. The idea that we can use a moment out of literature that, 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 and use the text out of the matrix to have this moment where we can mash and remix these multiple levels of experience that are crossed with different affective experiences, and that we can return once again to mediation is reality. What does it mean if we follow that? What do we mean when we come in contact with reality as constantly producing itself, as a system made up of flows, interruptions, and breaks, the becoming or self-production of reality? Mediation is the movement of events, of bodies, from one set of relations to another. It is nothing more or nothing less than mediation is a singularity of becoming systems. When I had my moment of uh, existential crisis, when I got relocated, when I relocated myself, it wasn't as a fixed thing. When I relocated myself, it was in a new pathway, a new kind of becoming. How do we study that? What does a cultural studies of mediation look like? How do we take aesthetics seriously to try to get, get to the root of the thing that we see all around us and that we're trying to get a grip of. When things, when these processes, these, these, this mediation is taking place at levels from subconscious levels all the way to global capitalism and every step in between. When that moment of mediation is you finding a set of coordinates within these systems that are necessarily overlapping and necessarily uh, informing each other. That's reality. We get to what I think, we, we get to change or transform the idea of aesthetics from that very safe thing that says this is the aesthetic thing, to now we have to think about aesthetics in a system. And then we have to think about the, the impact that the information revolution, the media, has had on the, the kind of dislocation, what, what uh, Deleuze called the deterritorialization of, of many, many things. Capitalism deterritorializes, that's what it does. First thing we have to do is say goodbye mass media. This notion that there's a media and then there's us is, is in a kind of binary relationship is, 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 is counterproductive. It's, 
It hasn't been that way for a very, very long time, if it's, it's ever really been that way. Okay, I follow what uh, Guattari uh, in the 1990s called post-media. He discussed post-media as a paradoxical period of global digital monopolies and local media, of monocultures and cultural complexities, of molar forms and minor movements, guerrilla radio when, uh, when, when Rage Against Machine turned the lights off and they introduced a provocation to, nomad, to nomadic aesthetics, that's a minor movement that happened. My question, did I hack my subjectivity? Did I use Rage Against the Machine to process myself? And if I did, what does that mean? What does that mean for what music is, and what does that mean for what I am? And we know what hacking is, I think. Hacking is that kind of process of, of transforming. It's something that's been showing up in, in popular, popular culture and popular conversation since the 70s. Life hacking is the next stage of, of hacking, or at least the, the comfortability and, and popularity of the notion of hacking. And life hacking is usually very innocuous. It's like using, you know, using your, your heated seats to keep your pizza warm. That's life hacking, using, using nail polish to, uh, to color code your keys. But I'm not, I'm not thinking about that. I'm not, when I'm thinking about life hacking, I'm taking the idea of life a little bit more seriously than just convenience. Because one of the problems with life hacking, this notion of life hacking, if we let it be just kind of, just kind of keeping your pizza warm conversation, then, then we lose the, kind of the richness, or the rich possibility of a, a multiple and shifting and shaping subjectivity. My question at that moment, the question that I couldn't yet articulate and it's taken many years to, to begin to articulate, is when I realized that I could use Rage Against the Machine as the counter to my existential crisis, I did something transformative that, I, that left me unsettled. Happy, pleased, transformed, but unsettled. And what unsettled me is this. What am I that I can use music to do this? And what is music? Is it this thing that we just hit play? Is it this thing we just learn to do? As a music educator, defining music as a thing that we teach people to perform, to be comfortable with the idea of music as this thing we put on a stage, to study music as this thing that, that, that happens without kind of the deep existential problems that I think it, it provokes. We, we fall prey, I think, to minimalizing a, a necessary resource in our society, and that we miss the thing that saved me, and the thing that saved many people that I talked to in the course of this research. I hear often, and in many different, many different musical styles, when I got into this, when I started doing responses, what do you mean, what do you mean? <laughs> And I say, well, what do you mean it saved your life? How did it save your life? And it's like, yeah, it saved my life. <laughs> but how did it save your life? Yeah, it did. <laughs> but talk about it. Dot, dot, dot. What do you mean? Because we don't, I don't think we have a vocabulary to understand even what we know. And this is, some, this is a provocation for social science, a complex social science that we need to, that we need to take seriously. First of all, we need to think about the, the, the shifting subject, the, the possibility that this thing, that this thing, that me, can be hacked and that I can hack it myself. That, uh, and we can, we can draw from post-humanist literature to do this. Here's a, here's a quick literature, re uh, literature review. Foucault, Rosie Verdotti, big fan. Humanist, uh, humanistic universalism is objectionable not only on epistemological but also on ethical and political grounds. She's suggesting that the humanist subject, the idea of you as a fixed, impenetrable, reasonable, uh, intellectually um, mobile subject is, is something that we really, we really 
we really need to think about deeply about that because there's very little evidence that that's the case. And if we keep imagining that human, the human subject is the, the pinnacle of all reality, then we're going to keep making the kind of mistakes that we're making because humanism ultimately is about the human supremacist. The outcomes of failure to address such epistemological and ontological problems are already with us and have proliferated. For Foucault and Guattari, the production of subjectivity becomes the very existential territory on which social, ethical, aesthetic transformations must be negotiated. Does that mean that our future is the Terminator? Does that mean that this is where we're going? Is that, because a lot of people working and writing in post-humanism, this is like the cover of their book looks like. <laughs> as opposed to this, a much more complex subject that understands the implications of us being, these are my favorite stats lately, 98.9% uh, genetically linked to the, the, the uh, great apes, 70% linked to zebrafish, 50% linked to cauliflower. <laughs> We share 50% of our genetic inheritance with cauliflower. 50%. 50%. Yeah, take that, vegetarians. With this kind of with this kind of continuity, thinking through continuity, thinking about life in terms of continuity presents new kinds of ethics and situates the human subject deeply in emergent flows of becoming that we are all part of these complex systems. And that the nomadic aesthetics that I'm talking about, these new movements, are new forms of communications that are consistent with the formation of new communities and ultimately new subjects. And we've already, we see this happening. No one expected it. In a world darkened by economic distress, political cynicism, cultural emptiness, and personal hopelessness, it just happened. somewhere in the United States to maintain the, uh, the constitutional right to free assembly. 18,000 people got together in a place with absolutely no infrastructure, built a community of 18,000 people, 
with kitchens and food and water and uh, uh, we dealt with our own garbage and our own uh, refuse, uh, <laughs> digging our own pits everywhere and building a language of inclusion and a, and a life system that for some people they lived there for two and a half months. We were there for two and a half weeks. Some people showed up for three days just to see it. Fourth of July, everybody gets together for the moment you wake up and it's silent until everybody holds hands in a big circle like this. And the point is to get rid of all of the war markers of the 4th of July, to get rid of the, the cannons, the militaristic parades, the, uh, the fireworks, all of the Djangoistic stuff. The, uh, the notion is that we need to have a 4th of July that's about peace and about making a peaceful future, not about preserving the kind of this, this ancient and kind of war-oriented uh, modality. I can't tell you what it's like. I can't lecture to you what it's like to, to be in that circle. I can't. It is affective transformation. You know that. That's why we need to do this. That's why we need to get in communities and have that experience of being in communities. And that experience of being in communities is at the core. When we talk about social movements, we're really talking about complex communities, emergent communities that are, that are erupting. This is a, an advertisement in uh, Adbusters magazine. Remember at the beginning where I was telling you those red stickers that I was putting on stop signs? We got them from Adbusters. You just write in, they send you them. It was about culture jamming. In the 20 years since then, culture jamming has transformed a little bit, but it's still the same people are still at the center. Culture jamming uh, leading up to Occupy was taking basically the notion of the rainbow gathering and putting it on Wall Street. Can we get 20,000 people to barricade Wall Street until the demands for real democracy are met? Occupy Wall Street movement. Take your tents, build kitchens, build community. And you might you will read stuff that, that's written by people that stay in their offices and write about social movements saying, it just erupted out of nowhere. My wife and I can tell you very clearly that at the Rainbow Gathering that summer, the leaders of the Rainbow Gathering were telling people how to block cities, how to shut them down by making sure your movements happen on bridges. Watch, uh, watch the politics in the United States now and the social movements and the number of times the marchers end up on bridges. It's not by accident. You shut down bridges, you shut down the system, the flow of systems. And once you do that, you, you've crippled the, the, the structure. That was the military advice, the organizational strategic advice given by the, the and shared around the, the rainbow gathering. And immediately within two months, the cover of uh, the New York Times showed all of the marchers leaving Zuccotti Park and getting arrested on the bridge, on bridges in Manhattan. These organic flows, these new kinds of effective politics, is all wrapped around these kinds of nomadic aesthetics. That art, culture, digital media, and even mental health are intertwined ecosystems. We know this. This is from this morning. Anchor Tracy Spicer ditches makeup to protest extreme grooming, dropping out of the system of dropping out of the aesthetic system. Time magazine said some years ago that you, I guess they meant individually, is Time Magazine's Person of the Year. My vote for this year uh, and for every year is the reality that we are producing. Crisis, when I say life hacking, life hacking in a time of crisis, I, you know, everybody believes, everybody believes they're in the end times. I get that. But things are really bad. And things are always, you know, probably always really bad, but bad is getting worse. And the kinds of protests that we're seeing, the kinds of nomadic protests that we're seeing, um, that I'm seeing in Twitter that aren't making the front page of any news is, is remarkable. This is the chief, uh, Mi'kmaq chief in New Brunswick, having a conversation with the RCMP. You see the RCMP are the people on their bellies with their guns drawn. 
This is the conversation that people are having on Burnaby Mountain um, yesterday. 100 people were arrested in the last, uh, the last day. Social movements use, individuals use music to transform subjectivities in the support of social movements. Playback! that the mediation that happens in our engagement with the media that we consume produces us and produces social movements. A social movement like, like hip-hop. Building on that, I started to put all of my focus on studying hip-hop in the last couple of years. Could have been anything. Just happened to be hip-hop. It started by trying to come up with a way of documenting local hip-hop. We started a class called, uh, uh, was in MLCS, it was just called Hip Hop Culture. The entire class was about writing the history of hip hop locally and, try, and reading simultaneously, reading uh, Linda Tang Smith's book, um, Decolonizing Methodologies. And the idea was to try to innovate new ways, of, new ways of writing history. Immediately after that, we started with members of the, the hip hop community that participated, that supported us in the Hip Hop History Project. We created a book club. <laughs> it was a book club, but we got together in the basement of a bookstore and read KRS One's the, the Gospel of Hip Hop. It was like uh, it was to book clubs. It was like the Fight Club of book clubs. <laughs> and uh, it was. It was an absolutely transformative act because there's, there's a lot of people getting together. Uh, the notion of sitting down reading with a bunch of hip hoppers I, I, you know, would be great to have photos of it because the bookstore owner was kind of amazed by this. He was amazed by this kind of really deadly political and deadly engaged kind of conversation with members of the, members of the circle who are, uh, who A, have never been in a book club, who never imagined themselves being in a book club, and that to me was instructive. The members of the hip hop community getting together in a cipher, we called it Cypher 5, the idea of the cipher or the circle, and uh, cipher from the, the notion of, uh, and we spelled it C-I-P-H-E-R, cipher is a hip hop circle, cipher C-I is about code breaking, and five, the number five is the fifth element, the element of knowledge. Cypher 5 turned into a conference that we put on last year called Hip Hop Heads, and we began, uh, we began to connect from this little group of people uh, that made up Cypher 5, became a symposium, we invited a whole bunch of people in from New York and Oakland and, and different places around the United States. Less than a year later, that group, Cypher 5, became the Canadian chapter of the Temple of Hip Hop in Canada, which is a global network that KRS-One is organizing. And now, new flows of information are being shared between members of the, the hip-hop community. So now, uh, we're in conversation with people from, from Indonesia to the Netherlands to Colombia, uh, all organized through, through the Temple of Hip-Hop. Simultaneously, I'm, I've started a lab called Sound Cultures Lab, and I'm trying to, trying to understand how people learn and are transformed in their engagement, their mediation. Uh, with technology. 
ultimately the question is for me, if we use music to form reality, how does mediation get shaped? And this is, this is the cultural studies element. This is the, 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 the big question, the open question that, that is framing my research. Recognizing that all of these systems, this mediation is synonymous with the formation of reality. How does the information or the media that we're engaged with shape our reality? And ultimately, in the shaping of a reality, form our subject. Remember, this will mediation, we're all connected. Public pedagogy is a notion of Henry Giroux, educational critical pedagogy scholar. My question to you is how what kind of subjectivity is shaped by the consumption of this kind of media? And this is also hip hop. Uh, five days ago, 11.8 million views. This morning, 13.5 million views. This is being consumed in, in incredible, incredible quantities. This, uh, the, the Nazi references, when the Nazi references were brought up, um, the director basically said, yeah, we use Nazi references. Lots of Nazi references. That's, you know, and. Yesterday, or two days, uh, within the last five days, this video was released. A statement coming out of a, a an Oakland area uh, hip hop artist, Paris, who was very successful as a um, within the conscious hip hop movement from the from the early 2000s, late 90s, early 2000s. I, I think the it's it's fairly evident what's what's being what's being suggested, and the references to Black Panthers throughout the video. There was none yet, but there's many references to Black Panthers throughout the video. We get a, a very clear idea of the of the discussion what he's presenting I want to go back to the opening question what is the subject of music education my presentation is not meant to close doors is not even meant to have a, a conversation uh, to have a conclusion in any sense the idea that that we are in a position where we have to take very seriously the preparation of of students for the very complex media environment that we're engaged in. 
and that we have to have a conversation of music and music education, not just as a way of understanding what is being seen, but as an introduction and a kind of an invocation to get involved in the ethics of, of the formation of subject. Not to say, oh, that's good or that's bad or that's terrible, I can't believe people are doing that. The reality is people are doing that. That's not the point. <laughs> Feeling bad about it, looking down your nose about it, that's not going to change the, the, the realities of, what, of what's happening. But I feel, what I'm concerned about is that I'm not certain that we have the vocabulary in the social sciences or humanities to even understand the, what, what, what is actually happening, the, 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 the kinds of politics and the kind of subjective formation that, that, is, is, that I've experienced and I think probably all of you experience every day. This is a really, um, this is in, in a democracy, in a, in a time where, where we have to articulate ways forward, ways through crisis, that we need to understand the, the, the powerful ways that we're forming ourselves as subjects of, subjects of a culture, subjects of a family, subjects of a, of a, of a city, of a province, of a country, subjects of a global information economy. And that, that subject formation is something that we are invited into and something that we're provided resources to do, but I'm not certain that we have the vocabulary to understand or to critique the value structures that were introduced to, the value structures that were provided. And without that, I'm afraid that the, that the, the kinds of organizational politics, the kind of aesthetic governmentality that is deeply embedded in the Nicki Minaj video where 13.8 billion million people, and this is gonna go up, you just follow it, it's only been, it's been a month since it's been released. That kind of that kind of consumption, that kind of mediation, we need to understand and we need to be prepared for. And I want to be very, very clear here and very careful that I'm not saying that when you consume something that you're transformed. That's not it. That's that's a, an old way of thinking about consumption and transformation in media. It's much more complex than that. Mediation makes both Nicki Minaj and us possible simultaneously. 13.8 million people are making this possible and we're already there to make this possible. This creation was already a virtuality before it became a reality. It was barely a bet when they released this. So the critique after the fact, that doesn't, that doesn't cut it anymore. We have to understand the kind of ethical, kind of ethical dilemma of the mediations that we're producing, the, the ethics uh, of subject formulation that we're engaged in, so that we can produce a kind of music education that prepares subjects to use media to transform themselves in more ethical, more community-oriented, more social and ultimately in healthier in healthier ways thanks